Allow me then to express my sincere thanks to the PSEP for inviting me to share these thoughts or this topic on pedagogy on culture-based education. But if I may be given the chance to lemonize further what this topic is all about, minarapat ko pong gamitin ang topic na ito, leveraging teaching and learning through culture-based education. I love the word leveraging because I want to invite all the participants today to start maximizing the power of teaching and the power of learning through culture-based education. When I receive the profile, the invitation of PSEP, there are two challenges that I have. Isa po dito is the composition of the online participants. And the other one is the 40-minute time allotments given to me by PSEP. I hope most of you here have seen the poster of PSEP. Ito po ang ating poster sa Kongreso ng Gurong Bagaral. And basically, all of you will agree with me that the original audience of this session are the student teachers, as the poster would put it, Gurong Magaral. But if you try to look at, the, at today's online composition, we have a total of 499 registered participants, and most of them are teachers in the field, spanning across elementary, secondary, and higher education, with 11 student teachers, two parents, and 12 from other centers. But just the same, I hope I'll be able to serve the purpose of all our participants for today's, for today's session. It has been said that time is the number one enemy of freedom. So this is my dilemma now. Between the two, between skills development and conceptual development, what exactly is my talk all about? And I opted to concentrate more on conceptual development. Within 40 minutes, mahirap po para sa akin, turuan ang bawat isa sa inyo kung paano ginagawa ang mga pedagogy ito. But I would like all the participants at the end of my session to be able to have or to acquire a very clear and strong concept about pedagogy on culture-based education. I hope the participants at the end of the learning session will be able to acquire and truly understanding. Karamihan naman po sa atin yung mga guro at alam po natin ang kahulugan ng enduring understanding. Nais ko po na magaroon tayo ng isang unawa hinggil sa pedagogy and culture-based education na magtatagal at pang matagal. I have prepared, I have indicated here five enduring understandings. Unang-una po, nais ko po ninyo maintindihan na ang bawat isang guro ay tagapagtaguyod ng kulturang Pilipino. Every teacher is a cultural worker. I hope at the end of my session, we'll be able to endure also this kind of understanding that every subject for those who are teaching in elementary and secondary and every course is a vehicle for culture-based education. Gamitin natin ang ating mga asignatura, ang ating mga kursong itinuturo bilang vehikulo upang ating mapalali, mapapalawak ang kulturang Pilipino. Third, I hope at the end of my session, or the session for this for today, we'll be able to understand better as teachers that cultural rootedness is the business of true education. Isa lamang po ang gampanin ng tunay na edukasyon. Napin, palalimin kung ano mang kultura mayroon tayo. And I hope, my dear colleagues, at the end of our session, we'll be able to have this, acquire, this enduring understanding that every learner is a cultural collaborator. Gusto kong makita ng bawat isang guro sa room, sa bawat, sa bawat isang klase, o mga magulang, na ang ating mga anak, ng ating mga estudyante, ay ating katuwang sa pagpapalaganap at pagpapalalim ng kulturang Pilipino. At higit sa lahat, regarding, you know, my topic on pedagogy and culture-based education, I want each one of you to understand that culture-based education entails an interrogation of one's understanding of pedagogy. While you are, while you are all interested to learn pedagogy, but very important that we, as we learn one pedagogy, 
we have to keep ourselves engaged in the process which I call as interrogation. Iba pa rin ang gurong nagtatanong. Iba pa rin ang gurong palatanong. The more we interrogate our pedagogy, the more we become a very good teacher in the classroom. Even the Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, one cannot bathe in the same river twice. Kahit kailanman ay hindi tayo maaaring maligo sa isang, sa isang ilog ng dalawang beses because change is taking place. Maraming pagbabagong nangyayari at ang mga pagbabagong ito ay nagkakaroon lamang ng kahulugan when we start questioning our own pedagogy, when we start questioning the way we teach, and we question the way our students learn in the classroom. My dear colleagues, if you look at the topic for this morning, Pedagogy on Culture-Based Education, mahalaga ang pangalawang bahagi, Culture-Based Education. So balit gusto kong ituon ang ating mga pansin tungkol sa unang salita, ang salitang Pedagogy. Because whatever kind of education we embrace, at the end of the day, it's still the pedagogy that matters. Because this pedagogy is our key to be able to put across whatever, of course, kind of education we're trying to embrace. Alam naman po natin na sa ating masusing pagtatanong bilang mga guro, napakaraming uri na ng mga edukasyon ang nangyari sa Pilipinas. Aha, marahil ang ilan sa atin ay alam natin ang literacy-based education, evidence-based education, community-based education, place-based education. At ngayon, gusto nating akapin muli ang, ang culture-based education. Ang tanong ninyo sa inyong mga isipan, paano kaya ito? Pwede kaya ito? At makakaya kaya ito? Ito ang mga karaniwang itinatanong natin sa ating mga sarili every time we interrogate the way we teach and the way our students learn. My dear colleagues, allow me to share my Alanic dictum. I'm using, of course, the word Alanic because if you happen to be a follower of Socrates, then you happen to be Socratic. If you happen to be a believer of Plato, then you, have, and you, and you are Platonic. But I want to advocate a kind of dictum, and this is my dictum for today, that pedagogy on culture-based education is a problem space and at the same time, a problematic space. Maaari po ang iba sa inyo ay magtatanong, ano ang kaibahan ng problem space sa problematic space? Hayaan po ninyong isalin ko ito sa wikang nauunawaan ng lahat, ang wikang Pilipino, kung sino na it come from the province of Bulacan. Pedagogy as a problem space sa wikang Pilipino ay ang pagtuturo bilang isang problema. Bilang mga guro o bilang mga magulang, kapag tayo ay nagtuturo sa ating mga anak, itinatanong natin, sino ba ang tuturuan? Ano ang ituturo? Kailan ituturo? At saan ituturo? Who are we to teach? What are we supposed to cover? When are we supposed to do that? And where can we possibly do this kind of platform? But the more important thing here is I would like you to embrace the idea that pedagogy is a problematic space. Sa wikang Filipino, ang pagtuturo sa ating mga anak, sa ating mga estudyante, ay isang gawaing pinuproblema. Iba ang bagay o iba ang taong may problema at iba ang taong pinuproblema ang isang problema. Sapagkat when we look at pedagogy as a problematic space, more than the who, the what, the where, the when, kailangan po nating masagot ang dalawang mahalagang katanungan. Bakit natin itinuturo ang kultura? At pag alam natin ang dahilan, madali na ang paraan. Dito umapasok ang tanong na how. My dear colleagues, the why and the how questions are the two important building blocks of pedagogy as a problematic space. It is not only a problem space, but more of a problematic space. And I would like you to look at our fifth enduring understanding that culture-based education entails interrogation of one's understanding of pedagogy. Bilang mga guro sa classroom, taon-taon kapag kayo nagtuturo at binabalikan ninyo ang mga dati ninyong mga lesson plans, mga dati ninyong PowerPoint, karaniwan nagtatanong tayo, pwede pa kaya ito? Parang hindi na pwede ito. 
So every time you entertain those questions, I'm telling you, you are trying to expand, you are trying to deepen, and you are trying to understand more the kind of pedagogy you are embracing as teachers in the field. So ang pinakamalaking tanong po ngayon ay bakit natin dapat akapin ang culture-based education? Why are we invited to embrace culture-based education? Allow me then to invite the members of this community to start looking at how we look at school. Paano ba natin naiintindihan ang kahulugan ng salitang paaralan? And I'm taking the definition from the Catholic school issued by the Vatican in 1977. And I love this definition. It, it reads, it is a privileged place in which through a living encounter with the cultural inheritance, integral formation of course. Ang paaralan, ang ating mga classroom po, ay isang lugar na natatangi. Privileged place. Wherein ang ating mga mag-aaral ay nagkakaroon ng encounter sa kanilang kultura. And this is where integral formation happens. So ang tanong po, kapag tayo, kapag binalagan po natin yung ating unang enduring understanding that every teacher is a, is a cultural worker. So how is culture taught? How is culture learned? Alam na po natin, tatlo ang paraan. One is through what we call enculturation, the process of knowing our own culture. It is also, of course, you know, important that our students get to know the culture of other people. And this is where acculturation comes in. And when they try to see that the culture of other nations and their own culture in their own context, this is where enculturation comes in. Pero sabi nga ho ng opening remarks ni Dr. Sani kanina, karaniwan po ang tanong, do we see a good balance between and among enculturation? Acculturation and enculturation. Madalas ang ating po nalibigyan pansin sa ating mga paaralan ay ang acculturation, ang pagkaputo ng mga bata ng iba't ibang kultura kung saan nakita natin ang kolonisasyon sa konteksto ng edukasyon. Now we ask the question now, Bila mga guro, what is your daily instructional emphasis? Ang matutunan ng kultura ng iba, ang matutunan ng kultura ng Pilipino, o makita ang pag-apply nito sa kanilang mga sariling problema? My dear colleagues, balikan po natin ang iba't ibang uri ng enculturation. Paano tinuturo ng mga magulang, ng mga guro sa paaralan, ang pagkaputo ng ating sariling kulturang Pilipino? Tingnan po natin, ito ay maaring post-figurative, pre-figurative, o co-figurative. Kapag sinabi natin post-figurative, ang pinagmumula ng pagkatuto ay ang guro at ang tinuturuan ay ang mga mag-aaral. Subalit ang karaniwan, ang itinuturo ng guro, ang alam ng guro ay ang kulturang kolonyal na ipinapasa sa mga mag-aaral. So learning now becomes problematic. Tinan po natin ang prefigurative. Sa prefigurative po, tinatawag natin na ang mga mag-aaral naman ang natututo sa kanilang mga guro. Kapag sinabi natin co-figurative, both students and of course another set of students are learning from one another. Now, my dear colleagues, we ask the question now, are we all ready to embrace culture-based education? Handa nga ba lahat ang mga umaaten sa webinar na ito na yakapin, na gamitin, na praktisin ang tinatawag na culture-based education? Balikan ko po muli ang sinabi ko kanina ni, Sir San, ni Dr. Sani at ni Sir John kung paano i-define ang culture-based education. It is a broad in transdisciplinary teaching process, learning system where culture is the object of inquiry. Tingnan po natin ang pinakamabigat na word sa definition. It is more of transdisciplinary na ang kultura ang object of inquiry. Napakaganda po ng sali na ginawa ni Dr. Galileo Zafra ng Pamantasan ng Pilipinas hinggil sa definisyon ng culture-based education. Nandoon pa rin ang transdisciplinaryong proseso na kung saan ang kultura ang paksa ng pagsisiyasat. Ito rin ang paksa ng pananaw methodology, bukal na talakayan, kasangkapan sa pagtatasa. Dito ang mga kasanayan, kakayahan, kaalaman, tungkol sa sarili, pamayanan, bansa at daigdig ay nililika. In other words, mga kapatid, 
kapag po tayo ay nagturo sa culture-based education, at the end of the day, natutunan ng mga bata ang content ng ating mga, ng ating mga asignatura o ating mga subject sa kurso. Pero at the end of the day, kaila po nila na mayroon silang matibay na painiwala na sila ay kabilang sa kulturang Pilipino. Tingnan po natin yung ginamit na term, transdisciplinary, hindi po ito intradisciplinary na kung saan kapag tayo nagtuturo sa, sa ating mga klase ay kanya-kanya tayo. Sabalit aminin naman natin o hindi, karaniwan po sa mga guro ay nagtuturo ng kanya-kanya. You teach math, you teach science differently, independent of culture. Karaniwan naman, sabay-sabay tayo tuturo, subalit we still make use of our own disciplinary knowledge. This is where the so-called multidisciplinary comes in. But remember, CBE is not multidisciplinary. It is transdisciplinary. Look at this one. It is what we call cross-disciplinary. Karaniwan, may mga guro na kung saan kapag tinuro ang nilang disiplina, ginagamit nila ang perspektibo o pananaw ng ibang disiplina. This is what you call cross-disciplinary sapagat maaaring kulang ang inyong disiplina sa pananaw kung kaya't ginagamit natin, inihiram ang pananaw ng ibang disiplina. Pagbili natin ng interdisciplinary, this is where integrating knowledge and methods from different, from different disciplines using a real synthesis of approaches. Medyo maganda na po ito sa pagkakalapit-lapit na po ang mga guro as they integrate knowledge and methodology. My dear colleagues, pag binalikan po natin ang definition ng culture-based education, this is something transdisciplinary. By this we mean, it's creating a unity of intellectual frameworks. Ito ho yung binanggit kanyang ni Dr. Sani na ang kulturang Pilipino ang magiging core ng pagtuturo ng lahat ng asignatura. Pagandang tingnan, mahirap gawin, so balit gagawin ba ng lahat ng ating mga guro? Allow me to share another, another, another Alanic dictum. I personally believe that the road to culture-based education as a transdisciplinary process is a long and challenging journey. Mahaba. At ito rin po ay magibigay sa atin ng marami mga hamon. Tingnan po natin, bago po natin marating ang transdisciplinary, mahalaga na tayo ay mag-intra, multi, cross-disciplinary, at interdisciplinary. Hindi ko tayo maaaring magturo ng ating asignatura gamit ang kultura hanggat hindi natin mastered o alam na alam kung ano ang ating tinuturo and much more kung ano ang sinasabi na ating kultura. Madaling marating ito sapagkat tayo pa inaniniwala that practice makes perfect. Karaniwang kasabihan, practice makes perfect. But allow me to share this book. I hope you can read this book. It is entitled, Practice Makes Perfect. Practice. And I love, you know, the statement given by Britzman in 1991 that learning to teach is always a process of becoming. Always a process of becoming. Sa Tagalog po, kapag tayo ay nagturo sa ating mga klase, ano ang nangyayari sa atin? What have we become after we, after we have taught a particular learning area? Ang tanong po, In the course of your teaching, for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, sa inyo pong pagtuturo na inyong mga asignatura, have you become a cultural worker? In the course of your teaching, have you made use of your subject content as a vehicle for culture-based education? In your long years of teaching, have you ever made cultural rootedness as the true business of education? In the long years of your teaching, Have you ever tried tapping your students as your collaborator in promotion of culture? And in the course of your teaching, have you ever tried interrogating your own pedagogy? Nagtanong ba tayo? Tinanong ba ninyo kung paano kayo nagtuturo sa ating mga classroom? Ito po ang napakalaking tanong. The big question now is, how well do we really understand pedagogy? Mahalaga po mahalaga, mahalaga po nating maintindihan ano nga, ano nga ba ang pedagogy. We always say that we are all teachers. But coming of course you know from the from the from the university level at times many teachers fail to understand what pedagogy is all about. 
My dear colleagues, I want you to understand the three waves of teaching and learning. This is where the word pedagogy, andragogy, and utagogy comes in. Ang inaaral po natin ngayon ay pedagogy on culture base. Wala pa po tayo sa andragogy. But whatever is the term pedagogy, andragogy, at utagogy, ang tinitignan po natin ay ang pagtuturo. Ang tanong, where do we find the locus of control? Sino ang may control? Sino ang mas nagiging makapangyarihan sa pagtuturo? Tingnan po ninyo ang ating pong graphical illustration ng pedagogy. Nasaan ang locus of control? Karaniwan, nasa guro, kaya tinawag na pedagogy. Kapag ito ay nabawasan at ito ay ibinibigay sa ating mga mag-aaral and they develop more learner autonomy, this is where andragogy comes in. And pag sinabi po natin yutagogy, Balansin na po, pantay na ang kapangyarihan ng mga mag-aaral kung saan sila po ay mas empowered. Kung tatalog, ang tatalogin ko po ito, coming from Bulacan, where every time, we, every time we teach our students, ang mga estudyante ay nagkakaroon ng alam. Subalit sa andragogy, meron na silang nararanasan. Iba ang taong may alam at iba ang taong may nararanasan. The higher level now is what we call yotagogy, kung saan marami na silang nauunawaan. Tingnan po ninyo nung kayo mga bata pa. Limited ang ating alam, kaya kaunti ang ating nararanasan. At dahil kaunti ang ating nararanasan, maliit ang ating nauunawaan. Tingnan po natin ta ang ating mga sarili ngayon. Bilang mga nagkaroon ng edad at may mga edad na, marami na tayong alam, marami na tayong nararanasan. At marami na tayong nauunawaan, kaya marami na tayong maaaring gawin sa ating buhay. My dear colleagues, the place of culture in teaching and learning in the terms of locus of control, let me use a metaphor. Tignan po ninyo ang isang bata na merong laruan. Iba ang isang batang may laruan. Iba ang batang naglaro kasama ng kanyang laruan. At iba ang batang nakikipaglaro. This is where pedagogy, andragogy, and yotagogy comes in. Look at my metaphor now. In pedagogy, binibigyan lang natin ng mga bata ng laruan. Ito ang tinatawag nating kaalaman. Subalit ang kaalaman ba nila ay may kaugnayan sa kanilang sariling kultura. Kapag sinabing andragogy po, ang mga bata ay nagsisimula ng maglaro ng laruang ibinigay sa kanila. And as they play with the toy, they gain experience. This is where nararanasan comes in. Ang pinakamataas na level ay kaya nang makipaglaro ng mga bata sa ating mga itinuro. Let me go back to the word school. Etymologically speaking, the word school is taken from the Greek word skole, which means leisure. Tingnan po ninyo ang inyong mga naranasan kapag kayo ay naglalaro. Masarap maglaro kapag tayo ay nag -e enjoy Subalit pag tayo nagtuturo, every time we teach our content, gaano tayo kasigurado na ang mga bata ay nag -e enjoy My dear colleagues, for us to be able to understand pedagogy and culture-based education, I would like to invite all of you to go back to our old notion of what constitutes pedagogical triangle. The pedagogical triangle is composed of three important elements, namely the content that we teach, of course ourselves as teachers, and the students. And ang tantanong, the more these three elements interact with one another, the more pedagogical situation comes in. That pedagogical situation for today is the so-called culture-based education. Allow me to share with you my third Alanic dictum. I personally believe that the overall success of any pedagogy rests on the quality of existing relationships. Tingnan niyo po, Balikan natin yung word na relationship na sa Tagalog, ito ay ugnayan. Even Kenneth Jurgen, a philosopher once said, relationships are processes that individuals cannot be separated from. Ito ang isang proseso na kailanman ay hindi pwedeng may pahiwalay sa buhay ng mga tao, sa buhay ng mga guro. Ano ang sabi ni Boy Abunda? Usap tayo, kaibigan. The more we dialogue, the more we understand things around us. I would like you to see now the dialogue between the teacher and the content, the student and the content, and the dialogue between the teacher 
and the student. If you look at this graphical rep representation, which among the three best describes the word relationship? Is it A, ang isang batang may laruan? Is it B, ang batang naglaro ng kanyang laruan? O letter C, ang bata kasama ng ibang bata na nakikipaglaro gamit ang kanilang mga laruan. May, may mga kapatid, look at now my graphical representation. I would like you to see yourselves. Do you belong to A? Do you belong to B? Or do you all belong to letter C? Allow me to use the German concept of Bildung. The word Bildung is a matter of tradition of cultivation. Pinagyayaman natin. But dalawa po ang pinagyayaman sa pagtuturo. The individuality of the student and their own sociality. Every time we teach math, every time we teach science, every time we teach our own respective content, knowledge, skills of our own discipline, ang dinidevelop lang po natin sa mga bata ay ang kanilang individuality. But remember, hanggat hindi sila nakipag-usap sa kanilang kultura, particularly the culture of the Philippines, there is no sociality. At the end of the day, we would like each and every learner of our classroom to claim that they learn something from us and they have become better Filipinos who are culturally oriented. Even of course, you know, even of course, sociologists would say that education is a form of socialization and socialization is in fact the process of education. Even Kenneth Jurgen once said, all meaning, all meanings, all meaning emerges from co-action that we as human beings create meanings through collaboration. Tanda ko po ang isang eksaminasyon o pagsusulod na ibinigay ko sa aking mga mag-aaral at lahat po sila ay nagulintang at hindi ho nakasagot. This was my essay exam. When does a ball pen become a ball pen? And everybody was asking me, Sir, tinuro ho niyo ba ito? But remember, this is a kind of question that will make my students think. When does a ball pen become a ball pen? Kung tanda po ninyo ang isang bata na may laruan, isang mag-aaral na may ball pen, ang ball pen ay nagiging ball pen kapag ito ay ginamit na natin. Unless we start relating with the ball pen, the ball pen remains to be an object. It becomes a ball pen when relationship is present. Kapag nagkaroon ng ugnayan ang isang bata sa kanyang ball pen, this is where, of course, you know, the ball pen becomes a ball pen. The same thing, we ask ourselves the question, when does a culture become a culture? May kultura tayo sa Pilipinas, subalit ang tanong, nakikipag-ugnayan ba ang mga bata dito? Iniuugnay ba ng mga guro ang kanilang itinuturo sa kultura kung saan ang mga bata ay nagkakaroon ng kanilang interaction, kultura ng kanilang komunidad? When does a culture become a culture. My dear colleagues, Cochrane Smith and Susan Little once said, teachers who know more teach better. Mas masarap magturo kapag mas marami tayong alam. Tingnan po natin ang ating pagtuturo. In your course of teaching, five years, 10 years, or 15 years, or for those of you who have been fossilized in the teaching profession, whose culture and which culture are we trying to deepen in our own in our own subject area. We have our own culture. Bilang mga guro, tayo may kultura. Ang ating mga itinuturo na mga asignatura base sa ating curriculum guide is what we call content culture. So, balit hindi natin dapat kalimutan na ang mga batang umapasok sa ating mga classroom ay may mga dalaring mga kaalaman. Ito ang kanilang kultura na nanggagaling sa kanilang komunidad. Kaya nga po kapag gagaroon ng, ng interaksyon o ugnayan, ang guro, ang kultura ng isang guro, sa kultura na kanyang itinuturo, ang tawag ko natin dyan is deontic relation. Ob obligasyon natin bilang guro na magaroon ng, ng dialogo ang ating sariling kultura at ang kultura ng ating curriculum guide. Mahalaga din na magaroon ng ugnayan ang ating itinuturo, kultura ng ating curriculum guide, sa kultura ng ating mga estudyante. Ang tanong, may kinalaman ba ang ating itinuro sa kultura at sa kanilang komunidad? This is where didactic relation comes in. At ang tanong, kapag nag-ugnayan ba ang ating mga estudyante at ang ating mga, mag ang ating mga guro, may kinalaman ba ang kanilang kultura? This is where pedagogical relation comes in. 
Kaya nga po, ito po ay isang napakabigat at tungkuli na maintindihan. Why, are, why am I, of course, you know, looking at teachers' culture, content culture, and students' culture? Simply because we want, of course, to understand what Verdoux in 1970 once propounded, the so-called cultural capital. At ang sabi ho niya, it is the familiarity with the legitimate culture within society. Ano ho ba talaga ang legit na sinasabi natin? Karaniwan sa nagtuturo tayo, ang pinag-uusapan lang ng mga guro ay ang kanilang curriculum guide. Ang mahalaga ay makover nila ang kanilang contents at the expense of what we call teacher's culture and student's culture. What is knowledge now? Tingnan mo ninyo, kapag nagturo tayo gamit ang ating curriculum guide, nagturo tayo gamit ang ating sariling kultura, nagturo tayo gamit ang kultura ng mga estudyante, nagkakaroon ng mas maraming kaalaman. Remember, teachers who know more, teach better. And no wonder, balikan natin, ano ang kahulugan ng knowledge? It is, of course, you know, the position from which people make sense of their worlds. Kung baga ho, kapag mas marami tayong alam sa ating tinuturo, alam natin ang ating sariling kultura, alam natin ang kultura ng mga bata, the more we can position ourselves and the more we can make sense of our, of our world. Eh, sabi nga ho ni Freire and Horton, if the act of knowing has to see, then today's knowledge something is not necessarily the same tomorrow. Kaya nga po mga kapatid, ang tanong ay ganito, can knowledge be negotiated? Pwede bang pag-usapan yon na ang kultura ng gulo, guro, kultura ng mga mag-aaral, at ang kultura ng ating curriculum guide ay mag-uusap sa isa't isa? Kaya nga po sabi ni Bordu, iba-iba ang pinagmumula ng cultural capital. One is the objective. Of course, ito yung mga nakita na, ito yung ating sariling kultura na. Cultural goods, books, works of art. Pero tingnan natin ang language ng mga bata. Ang kanilang mannerisms, baka sila ganun. At ano ang kanilang mga preferences. This is where the embodied cultural source comes in. And when we look at the qualifications, education credentials, this is where institutionalized sources of culture come in. The big challenge now is like this. What kind of pedagogy best supports culture-based education? Napakarami yung pedagogy ang maaaring gawin. But bilang guruho sa pamantasan, allow me to share, of course, you know, one of my best pedagogies that, I can, that I'm using in the class. You are given the option now in terms of arborescent pedagogy at rhizomatic pedagogy. Ano ba ang kaibahan ng arborescent pedagogy? Ang sinabing arborescent, Ito ang pagtuturo ng pataas. Subalit ang rhizomatic pedagogy ay pagtuturo ng pahalang. Are we teaching vertically or are we teaching horizontally? What do I mean by arborescent pedagogy? This is what Jeff Duncan Andrade calls as above the ground developments. Above the ground developments. Where children have strong trunks, matayog ang kanilang alam, Marami silang alam sa mathematics. Marami silang alam sa science. So, balit walang alam sa kultura. Patayog ng patayog, pataas ng pataas. This is because teachers are only teaching the so-called so content culture and disregarding now the culture of their own and the culture of the students. Our tendency is to be skewed. Ang ating concentration po is more of the content culture. Why don't we start dialoguing with our own culture? Why don't we start dialoguing with the culture of our student, students? My dear colleagues, allow me to use the so-called rhizomatic pedagogy. This was propounded. This was advanced by French you know, um, philosophers and psychoanalysts, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, respectively. Napakaganda ho ng rhizomatic pedagogy sapagat ang tinitingnan natin dito ay ang hindi lamang ay ang pataas na paggalaw ng isang puno, kundi rin po ang pahalang na paggalaw. This is typical of a rhizome, similar to luya or ginger. It is a horizontal stem of a plant from which a variety of plants can grow. These stems are known for their propensity to spread rapidly, sapagkat ang nakita po nating paggalaw ng isang halaman ay pahalang or what we call the horizontal movements of our lesson. Let me share with you my Alanic Dictum. I believe that rhizomatic pedagogy is a deviant pedagogy. 
Isa ho, ito ho ay usang uri ng pagtuturo na tayo po ay lumilihis. We become deviant from the standard now. And I love the statement of Deleuze and Watari when they define, unlike the graphic arts, drawing or photography, unlike tracing, the rhizome pertains to a map that must be produced, constructed, and this is a map that is always detachable. Ito ang maganda ko sa rhizomatic, rhizomatic pedagogy. Maaring tanggalin detachable. Maaring ibalik. It is reversible. Pwedeng balik ta rin. Pwedeng baguhin. It's something modifiable. And it has multiple entryways and exits. Maraming pasukan. Maraming labasan. And no wonder, ang term po na ginamit ni Luz at Guattari ang tinatawag na lines of flight. What is a lines of flight? Tinanong ninyo, Kapag tayo nagtuturo, karaniwan is only on the vertical axis now. We have to cover all the competencies or the most essential learning competencies in our curriculum guide. Ito ho yung pula. Pero subukan nyo pong mag-deviate. Subukan nyo pong mag-iba ng landas by using the culture of the students, their community culture, but still teaching the original content of your discipline. CBE is indeed a rhizomatic kind of teaching. Kapag pahalang po ang ating pagtuturo, mas nakita po natin na mas marami po tayo nagagamit. Look at this now. We can make, we can capitalize on the culture of one student, at one point another student, at another point of, of another student. Ang malaking tanong, gaano po natin kakilala ang kultura ng ating mga estudyante? Gaano po natin kaalam ang mga komunidad kung saan sila nanggagaling? My dear colleagues, Knowledge, of course, you know, can be negotiated. We're in, in culture -based, in the pedagogy of culture-based education, mahalaga po nating makita na hindi lamang po ang ating curriculum guide, ang content, ang kultura. Maaaring gamitin ng kultura ng guro, maaaring gamitin ng kultura ng mga estudyante. Even the Association for Supervision and Curriculum once said, if we understand our learners, let's understand first their learning environment. If we truly understand our learners, alamin natin kung handa ba sila. Kapag ginamit natin ang kanilang kultura, mas handa sila sa pagkatuto. Because ito ang kanilang karaniwang ginagawa at ito ang kanilang naging buhay na. If we know their learning engagement, the more of course we understand the learners. And the more we understand the learners, the more we capitalize on the emotional intelligence. Allow me to share with you a culture-based engagement through the years. I was featured one time in November 15, 2011 in Manila Bulletin because of my culture-based engagements. And no wonder in 2011, I got the 2011 Metrobank Foundation Outstanding Teacher Award in higher education category because of my culture-based engagement. And what is this culture-based engagement I'm talking about? Because I belong, of course, I, I'm teaching you know, the future teachers in the College of Education I believe that I have to prepare every teacher, regardless of their subject matter, science, math, and English now, to start capitalizing in their own culture. The culture becomes the core of their teaching. This is where transdisciplinary process comes in. For example, when I was teaching, of course, you know, the, the future language teachers, I introduced a so-called writing, wherein drawing and writing rolled into one. Karaniwan ho, Kapag nagtuturo ang isang language teacher ng pagsusulat, we normally, of course, you know, give our students topic to work on. Karaniwan, ang topic po ay bigay ng guro according to curriculum guide. But why don't we start capitalizing the culture of the students? So how do they do it now? In my language research class, I made use of the traditional Filipino art as the writing stimulus. And I want the children now to have an encounter with their own culture. Specifically, I capitalized on this kind of traditional Filipino art, which was popularized by Aling Luz Ocampo, coming from uh, San Miguel Bulacan, who is one of the awardees of CCP for Gawad Manlilika. I consider her as a local wisdom teacher. Why? Because she taught us, first she taught, of course, Alan de Guzman, Ocampo, about how, not how to make pastillas, but how to make use or how to make pastillas wrapper. And in Bulacan, we could normally call this one as pabalap or the pastillas wrapper. And through what we call Japanese paper and cuticle scissors, we can of course produce different work of arts. And look at this. 
I ask my English teachers, of course, to prepare lessons using Pabalat. And one of them, of course, you know, told their students, I would like you, of course, to make the Pabalat using your own culture. And one of the students made the Pabalat about their Tarshir because he comes from uh, Bohol. Another one made the Banga. Another one made a short story regarding Cascasero. Another one made use of an ode, of course, Ode to Ninoy. Another one is an essay entitled Glory for Cory. And another one re prepared a poem entitled Dalaga sa Ilalim ng Ulan. Another one made a short story entitled Hanggang sa Dulo ng Walang Hanggan. Another one made use of Bahay Kubo. Another one made use of Bakya. Another one made use of Bangus because he comes from the Gupan. And another one made use of Bangusan. So in other words, my dear colleagues, the more we capitalize on the community where the students are coming from, the more we make use of their culture, the more we enrich their learning. They learn English and they also learn their own culture and even they propagate their own culture. Another one is Butong Kawayan. Another one made, you know, a, story, a short story entitled Duyan. Another one made Jezebel, Ethnic. Gitara, the one coming from Cebu. Kalabira, Indayog, Kalabaw, Tara, Yahitayo, and even Kamainila. That in one of the semesters wherein I was assigned to teach math research, I made use of ethnomathematics and students' learning of Euromathematics. Traditionally, when teachers you teach mathematics, they use you know, the European mathematics. But I invited all my mathematics student teachers to start using now the ethnomathematics, mathematics, where Ian, they have to make use of what we call guli. And of course, you know, I of course I made use of puni ball. We made use of we made puni bird. Gumawa ang mga bata ng puni star. Gumawa ho kami ng puni palaspas. We buy gumawa ng puni bracelets, okay? And some, of course, made use of puni parol. And I brought my students to Luisiana, Laguna, for them to have an encounter with this industry now. And at the end of one day, all my math teachers were able to learn. These are all my student teachers. They were able to learn how to weave baskets. And they asked me now, Doc Alan, what are we supposed to do with this uh, learning now? And I individually told them, I would like you now to start thinking of what lessons in mathematics can be taught using, you know, the so-called math weaving or what we call basket weaving. And one of my teachers developed a lesson entitled one, two, three, find math in geometry. And in, this, in the content, search for patterns now, instead of traditional way of drawing on the board, the students were asked how to weave, you know, maths. And this is where they learn the so-called search for patterns. Imagine my original slides regarding the culture, the content of culture, the search for patterns, and the culture of the community. When the two start, you know, dialoguing with one another, learning becomes better, and they become oriented with their own culture. So this is how we normally do mathematics teaching in our laboratory school in the University of Santo Tomas. So this is some of, the, some of the examples used by my students as they teach mathematics using the traditional Filipino culture. Next, why don't we, of course, teach math using art? Our traditional poetry, napakarami yung tula sa Pilipinas na kung saan pwedeng turuan ang mga bata ng mathematics. We can use architecture, we can use music, we can use even the textile o yung ating mga tela po, mga habis sa iba't ibang lugar sa Pilipinas or even religion can be used in the teaching of mathematics. I remember when I joined the Metrobank Search for Outstanding Teachers in 2011, these are the five finalists. These are the five finalists now, and, you come from, and they come from UP Manila, Ateneo de Manila University, UST, UPLB, and the one from DLSU. But for this presentation, allow me, of course, to highlight one of my best you know, contenders at that time Dr. Alele Sevilla from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. No? She didn't make it, but I love, of course, the way she teaches mathematics in UPLB. Remember, she's a teacher in college and teaching, of course, higher mathematics. But every time she teaches math, she would always make use of the traditional culture. For example, according to her, she can teach students now counting combinations, sets, 
by clapping combinations to the tune of Leron Leron Sinta. In one of her lessons on Thucydides' relation, she made use. She taught, of course, elementary students the song Enero, Febrero, Marzo, Abril, Mayo, Junio, Julio, Agosto, Setiembre, Octubre, Noviembre, Diciembre, Lubi, Lubi. Very simple, traditional Filipino song, but children in grade school can learn the concept of ordinal, even, of course, precedence. Why don't we, of course, teach sets and even cardinality by using the song Bahay kubo kahit munti ang halaman doon ay sari-sari sing kamas at talong sigarilyas at mani sitaw bataw patani Look, I'm teaching, you know, bahay kubo but I am achieving the same content on sets and even cardinality. When you teach full numbers, addition, subtraction, why don't we, of course, engage our students in the playing of the traditional uh, game that, like sungka? Every time we teach numbers and number sets, why don't we, of course, introduce them to our, of course, one of, the, one of our games, the one of Jack Stones? Every time, of course, we teach lines, perimeter and area, some of our mathematics teachers can capitalize on the play or on the game, patintero. My dear colleagues, as I wrap up now my presentation for this morning, allow me to share with you my conclusion. What I am selling in this presentation is a rhizomatic pedagogy, a kind of teaching that tries, of course, to entertain multiple entries and multiple exits, because I believe that rhizomatic pedagogy is a promising pedagogy in the field, particularly as we embrace culture-based education. Why am I saying this a promising pedagogy? Why? Because we get to see that there is what we call a recognition that in the classroom there are three kinds of knowledge. Our curriculum guide, the culture of our teachers, and the culture of our students. And I hope, my dear colleagues, when you start embracing rhizomatic pedagogy, that your curriculum involvement is not only routinized, covering only your curriculum guide. It is only, it's not only adapted but your curriculum involvement becomes more innovative. Why? Because you teach your subject matter using the contents, using the community culture. And I hope, of course, that when you make this a culture-based education, we can still, you know, adhere to what Sternberg's hierarchic intelligent theory is telling us. Our students will become also analytical. They will also become practical. Why? Because they get to see their own culture. And they also become creative in the classroom because they deal with their own culture. Going back, my dear colleagues, to the concept of the German Bildung cultivation, you teach your subject matter, I respect that. This is where individuality comes in. But do not forget, culture, community culture, can be used as the core of the teaching, of our teaching, in order for us to achieve the other aspects of cultivation, the one of sociality. My dear colleagues, I want, of course, every Filipino teacher to see that the Filipino culture is a powerful teaching learning resource. Now, as we end this session, as you end your encounter with Doc Alan, you have four options now. With the Filipino culture, will you be doing more with less? Will you be doing less with more? Or will you be doing more with more? Or doing less with less? I believe that the Filipino culture is a rich culture. So why don't we do more with more? And finally, mga kapatid, ang aking panghuling tanong, is everyone ready to embrace culture-based education? Kapag po ang sagot ay oo, then, my dear colleagues, sabi ni Boy Abunda, usap tayo. Maraming maraming salamat.